So in 1510, while Michelangelo is painting the Sistine Chapel, Raphael, who is not yet 26 years old, arrives in Rome to paint frescoes in Pope Julius II's private chambers in the Vatican. And these frescoes are often considered the perfect example of high Renaissance achievement. Everything seems perfectly ordered and graceful, yet fully alive and natural, as if all these figures are convincing presences in the room. And the artistic power announces and supports the Pope's political power. So Stanza della Signatura means the room of the signatures, and it suggests what the purpose of the room is. This is where decisions are made by the supreme ecclesiastical tribunal that would require the Pope's signature. So it is like the Oval Office for the President of the United States. It's a room of state, in this case for a theocratic regime. So although it's also a library, and it's intended as being Pope Julius II's personal space, it is personal space that actually functions politically because who he invites in here is are the elite few who are part of his ultimate decision making in his political rule. So the frescoes that are deemed appropriate for this room represent the four major branches of humanist learning. So we have theology, philosophy, literature, and jurisprudence. And the iconography of the room is communicating the idea that the Pope's authority rests on a perfect balance between the different branches of knowledge in Renaissance culture. In true humanist fashion, literature is represented in terms of the Greek and Roman ideals, where Apollo, the Greek and Roman god of enlightened knowledge and the arts, learning and artistic achievement, he's standing on his peak domain Parnassus, the mountain of high artistic achievement, surrounded by writers who are both from the classical past, such as Sappho, the ancient Greek poet, and also from the time of the Renaissance. And then philosophy is illustrated on the adjacent wall in this famous fresco, the School of Athens, that depicts ancient Greek thinkers and scientists with Plato and Aristotle at the center. It is a celebration of human reason, and it faces the wall that represents theology. Oops. A celebration of God, of religion, not of human reason. Theology is represented by a congregation of saints and Catholic teachers. It's titled Disputa because they are discussing the debate on the Holy Sacrament. So because it is across from the philosophy panel, there's a suggestion that these are complementary paths to truth, faith and revelation and rational inquiry. And the fourth wall is divided in two parts um, across the door, but it basically provides civil law alongside canon law. So again, the idea of balance, balance between the religious law, the canonical law of the Catholic Church, and the civil law of the city. Absolutely, the iconic standout work, though, is the School of Athens. And as the textbook quoted here explains, this is definitely his most famous achievement. I like this wording, a grand conception of harmoniously arranged forms in rational space. In fact, I want to argue that we can see this particular fresco as a kind of summation of the Renaissance, the high Renaissance, the ideals that have been motivating and developing in the art we've been studying. And certainly that's true in the linear perspective that creates this amazingly systematic and mathematically impeccable logical space, utterly convincing. And isn't it brilliant that the orthogonals moving backward would converge at Plato and Aristotle, these founding philosophical minds of the Western tradition. And then we have Roman architecture so faithfully rendered with the barrel vaults, with the coffered ceilings. We have a sense of kind of the grandeur of the past 
literal, literally expressed in the architecture. We have Minerva, also known as Athena to the Greeks, and Apollo, these great deities of Greco-Roman culture, sort of expressing how the revival and study of that culture has broadened the minds of Renaissance Italians. And I would say that this entire painting is a celebration of learning. We talked about the Renaissance as not just about a style, but about a kind of mindset that is committed to creating new knowledge. And we've also talked about the, Re the Renaissance as a humanistic force. So this is very appropriately shown in this painting, which is very much a dialogue between the learning of the ancients and of the Renaissance. So in terms of this idea of dialogue as learning, we have great philosophers shown as if engaged in solemn discussion, right? And yet there's this incredibly serene feeling created through the symmetrical space, as if their discussion is ordering the world right, with like such as this classical vault, vault opening to the blue sky, sort of suggesting that their minds are lofty like the architecture. And I want you to understand that there's a real complete engagement with the various branches of knowledge. So Plato and Aristotle are the most famous thinkers of antiquity, and their hand gestures refer to their philosophical systems. So Aristotle places his hand horizontally to suggest how his philosophy looks to the earth to understand the nature of reality based on observation of the material forms. But Plato points upward, arguing for pure ideas from the realm of mind. We have Socrates engaged in an argument at left, and he's enumerating points on his fingers. We have, oops, darn it, that's coming soon. Hold on, let me fix. We have Diogenes sprawled on the steps. He very famously rejected all worldly attachments. This famous story of Diogenes is that he, he owns nothing, he wants nothing. He is a complete renunciate of worldly possessions, gives everything up, goes with a little bowl to the lake to drink some water and he sees this shepherd standing in the water drinking from his hands and Diogenes says what do I need with all this worldliness meaning his bowl and he throws the bowl away stripping everything down to the bare essentials this is Diogenes as a philosopher and then we have over here on the right we have Euclid if you've studied Euclidean geometry you can thank Euclid. He's bending down to draw a circle on a slate. Over here, Pythagoras is demonstrating a system of proportions on a slate. Remember Brunelleschi and his Pythagorean system of proportions in the Church of San Lorenzo. So all of these great minds are gathering the kind of knowledge that has infused Renaissance art. And over here, there's Raphael, painted in his self-portrait, looking out. And my favorite detail of this painting is this one oddball figure who's sort of alone, and it's Michelangelo. It's kind of a, an affectionate portrait of Michelangelo as the eccentric genius. He's wearing his stonecutter's boots. Everyone else is in these you know, beautifully draped togas of lovely colors. He's wearing his stonecutter smock. He's making a drawing on this block of marble, and he's got his head in his hands, suggesting his kind of brooding disposition and his deep thinking. And Raphael sort of peeks out in his more courtly fashion, giving us a sense of their different personalities. But in terms of the status of the artist, really implying that these artists belong with Pythagoras and Euclid and Plato and Aristotle. The status of the artist has risen so much here that we're seeing them being claim, claiming for themselves a place among the intellectual greats.